Okay, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Preble. I'm a counselor and educator here in the San Union High School District. I'm just going to share with you that um, I'm actually, I'm going to record this session per the terms and conditions of, of, of uh, our agreement. So I, I already started recording. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you now. It's been a while since I've done Zoom. Um, Megan Peterson, admit, admit. And I have a kind of a warm up activity while I allow more people to, to enter. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let me just present this. So if you would, maybe I know in the chat room, uh, well, first go ahead and sign in. So the, the whole purpose of this, this uh, whole workshop slash presentation is, is to talk about skills and mindsets and to really answer the question, why? Why? A lot of students have that question, why are we doing this? So answering the question, why, with a focus on the development of skills and mindsets. So I know you need to sign in in order to get paid. Um, and so please, if you would, while other people are joining, um, please go ahead and uh, sign in using the, the link there, the bit.ly link that's on your screen. I might post it in the chat after more people are, are joining. And then in the chat room, please share your name, your current position, the school you work for, and then think about your first job. Please think about your first job and importantly, the skills that you needed to not only obtain, but maintain that job. So go ahead and take a minute to sign in and then please share out in the chat room, your name, your position, the school you work at in the SUHSD, and then share if you would your first job, your first real job. Where did you work? And what skills did you need in that first job? Uh, not only to obtain that position, but maintain that position. So I see uh, Bundan, uh, same here. I've always been hustling. My Actually, my mom raised me to be a hustler. My mom raised me to be industrious. I didn't get rewards for grades. I got rewards for being industrious and hardworking. Interesting. Um, if you would, what was your first job? And then what skills did you need? Okay. Oh, lifeguard, swim instructor, CPR. Punctuality, respect, being reliable and vigilant. Yes, keeping an eye on everybody. Being observant. Okay, what, what, what was your first job? Uh, when you were a groundskeeper, what skills did you need to get that job as a custodian, a groundskeeper? And what skills did you need to be able to keep that job? Babies are us, boy. I miss that, right? Babies are us, toys are us. So many, so many places have gone. And this is important. This kind of comes back to, to my focus as a, as a, as a researcher and educator and counselor. Um, a lot of jobs are changing. Babies are us is gone. Toys are us is gone. Osh is gone. Sears gone. Um, interesting. Patience. Thank you. Um, physical endurance. Okay. Social worker, uh, you were a tutor. Okay, Maria Ruiz. You needed patience and compassion, and good time management and reliability. Thank you. School secretary, what did you need? What did you need? What skills did you need for that first job? A lot of times we're, we're preparing students for the world of work. Um, what skills will they need to get that first job? And I've seen so many students get that first job and really transform getting that job. Um, retail store, awesome. I see uh, patience. Uh, you're right. People, <laughs> working retail is huge, right? So working retail, people can be horrible. 
but have, being patients, maybe not taking things personally. Oh, music therapist, interesting. Patience, having love and kindness. Preschool, nice, nice. Need how to work with the public. Okay, um, shaved ice, wow. Okay, I worked at Baskin Robbins, interesting. Very, very interesting. Bus boy, um, what skills did you need as, as a bus boy? Well, we can't use that term anymore, bus boy, right? What, what interesting. Um, be on time, cleaning quickly, being polite, um, not being noticed. What do you mean by that? Interesting. Um, okay, just a few more minutes. I know people are signing in through Bitly. Um, oh, being able to uh, physical labor and construction. I hear that. I hung drywall. I, I, I dug ditches. I did my, uh, my grunt work. I was a gopher. Awesome. Excellent. Okay. Just a few, um, just a few. So you signed in and you're probably sharing in the chat room. And um, we'll give it another, another, another minute here to give people time to not only sign in, but answer the question in the chat. Um, role model, huge, huge customer service. That's, yeah, I worked at Baskin Robbins myself. That was my first quote unquote real job. Customer service, cleanliness, punctuality, discipline, not to eat all the ice cream. Interesting there, Catherine. My first boss at Baskin Robbins told us to eat all the ice cream we wanted to. Uh, so smart because after a day or two, I, I, I couldn't eat anymore. And uh, I, I hate ice cream to this day. I'm going to be 50 years old and I hate ice cream. Okay, patience. Interesting. Um, fast and detail ordered, oriented. Uh, Mr. Spencer, the the link is posted right up here on, on the screen and it should be in the uh, chat room as well, posted up above. Interesting. Okay, maybe I should post it one more time here. And uh, so let me just go ahead and get started. Thank you for sharing and thank you for joining and, and, and giving your, your time. Um, the purpose of today's workshop presentation is just to be able for you to be able to understand different conceptual frameworks and hopefully a newer type of conceptual framework, dealing with skills and skill development. Also, uh, just really when we're, we're working with students, just to understand that the development of specific skills and specific mindsets can enhance employability. Jobs are going away. Part of our role as educators is to prepare students for the world of work that's ever changing. And students are gonna need skills to be able to obtain and maintain jobs. And as a career counselor, I can tell you, current research says we're preparing students for jobs that don't exist right now, currently, and students will have eight to 10 jobs throughout their career. Think about you with your first job and your second job. Think about you, even in the field of education, some of you have had two or three different roles, two or three different occupations within education. Career is a journey and the journey is, is challenging. And I'm gonna argue the more skills that we enhance and the more skills that we help students develop, the more employable and the more successful they'll be in life. Also, for just practical purposes, just being able to identify skills and mindsets being taught in a specific lesson. So, and I'll share with that. So maybe when you're doing your lesson plan or when you're having your, when you're putting your information on the board to actually just state the skills that are gonna be taught in a certain period, um, collaboration, communication, reading, writing, thinking, um, problem solving, and uh, also being able to build self-efficacy efficacy with students by, by noticing the skills that they have and helping them identify them, because a lot of students don't know how skillful they actually are. So that's our purpose. So we have certain problems with education, and there's a problem, and uh, they're always going to have problems, but one of our major problems would be that Education has multiple purposes, just by its nature. There are multiple purposes in education. What is the purpose of an education? Do you, go to do you go to school to be educated? And that works for some of us. Or do you go to school with a more pragmatic focus um, to be able to prepare for the world of work? Um, this goes back to the big divide, liberal arts versus career and technical education. So, and there's no one size fit all. We're dealing with dynamic students, dynamic populations. 
And the liberal arts work for certain populations that work for me, a bachelor's in history, master's in history, going to school just to be educated. I am also a proponent and uh, an advocate for CTE. Why? Because we have diverse needs being met by a diverse population of students. So we have these conflicting pur purposes or roles in education. Um, and of late, especially with this debate between liberal arts and career and technical education, uh, a lot of people question the relevance of an education. What is the purpose of going to school? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing here? Um, do you go to school to become an educated person? Or do you go to school to prepare for the world of work? Or maybe a little bit of both? You know, we see that debate going on in our society. I think about this, uh, actually this book, uh, this book that came out probably 20 years ago or so. All I really need to know, I learned in kindergarten. And I'm not an advocate or a proponent of that. Um, I just think that this exemplifies the problem, right? It's kind of um, kind of insulting for someone who's been in education and worked at the secondary school level for so many years, 24 years. Um, but there is there's a population and a growing questioning of the relevance, right? And as good teachers and good educators, we always focus on the relevance, right? Rigor, relevance, and relationship. I think of Mr. De La Segas, who told me that when I worked underneath him over at Everett Alvarez. Um, just thinking back to the students that I've served in middle school and high school, and even this summer, I taught summer school, um, questioning the relevance. You know, when am I going to use this in real life? When am I going to use this? Why are you teaching me this? Um, when you focus on skills, and my argument is when you focus on skills, you bring home that relevance, right? Um, students will ask me this. Why am I, even as a counselor, why am I doing higher math? Why am I studying subject X? And I said, well, you, when you focus at the microcosm, um, you will use this in your real life. You will use this because you're exercising your brain, but you have to focus on specific skills to make it super relevant. And we'll get to that. Um, and you know, you have those students that, that ask why, right? Why are we doing this? Not only will I use this, but why are we doing this? Is this just busy work? And uh, there's no such thing as busy work. There's no such thing as busy work when you're focusing on skills. So looking at typologies and, and the questioning of why, you will have a certain population that questions the why. Why are we doing this? You have the, the students that are the what ifs, that see the big picture, that, um, that are dynamic in their personalities. And then you have the imaginative types that, that are personal and social. That, that need the reason, why are we studying this? And then you have some that need to know what we're doing, and then we need some that need to know how we're doing it. So when you're preparing your lessons and when you're giving your instruction, maybe thinking about those different learners help, right? But for our purpose, it's targeting the questions that ask the why. And, and um, when it comes to skills, and so that's my argument, when someone says, why am I studying this? Why am I in school? Well, you're developing your skills and you're developing your skills for multiple reasons. And, and uh, when I discuss skills with students and I've heard many different presenters talk about skills, just know there are many different frameworks for discussing skills and not any of them are perfect. And probably I'm gonna introduce one to you today, but note that um, you're probably not gonna go for that. It's more of a CTE type of thing, um, but there are problems with each conceptual framework. So you probably have heard this, 21st century skills. We need to teach students skills for the 21st century. And, and while this is popular, and this is kind of a, a good buzzword and uh, people refer to it a lot, uh, just note that uh, these are not new. These skills are not new. <laughs> a lot of these skills that they talk about as 21st century skills are not new. Um, are they needed more now, more now than ever before? Uh, I'm not so sure. I'm turning 50 this year, and, and I can tell you that um, these were also relevant um, 25 years ago. So uh, there's kind of a problem with this, with this, this terminology, 21st century skills. You might hear of the four C's. Um, creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. And then there'll be a whole host of different skills underneath each one of those seeds. And, and this is good, this is helpful, and this is useful, um, but just think of the limitations that this sets up. Um, only four major skills, um, what about the others? 
um, this is kind of incomplete, right? When you're talking about skills, it becomes quite, quite nebulous. It's a good framework, people refer to a lot, but um, it's not, I would say, complete. Um, you're gonna hear this one a lot, soft skills. Soft skills, students need to develop soft skills. Students need to be, develop soft skills, and then, of course, hard or technical skills. Um, there's a problem with this conceptual framework when we try to understand skills. There's a negative connotation with soft skills. Calling them soft skills uh, leads me, people to believe that they're very easily developed and they're not, right? They're not easily developed. They're super important, but they're not that easy to develop and they take time. So there has been a push to move away from soft skills and hard skills and I'll share in a minute. You'll hear about essential skills. Um, there are certain skills that are essential and people will list certain soft and hard or technical and employability, which I'll get to in a minute, under this category, essential skills. But there's a problem with this. It kind of says, uh, are there some that are non-essential? Um, it's kind of problematic. Um, I, I tend to look at workforce foundations. I have a doctorate in occupational technical studies and my whole research was about skill development and employability. And, and one of the terms that comes up, or one of the conceptual models that comes up will be workforce foundations. The problem with this is that it's really focused and biased and, and pushing people towards the world of work when work constitutes part of someone's life, but not all of it. So this, this is helpful, but it also can be uh, incomplete and it could have a, a kind of a negative connotation. Um, one organization that I'm a member of and I publish uh, for a lot is the Association of Career and Technical Education, the ACTE. And the ACTE is proposing a, a new type of framework where instead of talking about soft skills and hard skills or about the four C's or about 21st century skills or essential or workforce development skills or workforce foundations, we focus on employability skills and technical skills. And you'll hear a lot of this when you're talking about um, career and technical education coursework. We'll talk a lot about employability and technical skills. The issue here again is the focus on work. And uh, I, outside of world of work, which we spend most of our time, um, some of these skills are needed just for life, right? When you retire or when you're on vacation, you still need to have many of these skills. So I just want to introduce to you the, the topic of workforce foundations and foundational skills. This comes up a lot when I talk to employers. I, I interview a lot of employers for, for the research that I conduct and for some of my publications. And a lot of employers will say, I want students to have a foundation. I just want them to have a, a basic foundation and, and the foundational skills. So just, and then I'll train them on the job, OTJ, okay? So these foundational skills include basic skills. You're reading, you're writing, you're math, you're speaking, you're listening. You know, so many people hear, but they don't listen. Well, these are considered basic skills, basic foundational skills. And then certain thinking skills, like being creative and being a problem solver and learning how to learn, not what to learn, but how to learn and then thinking critically. And then we have certain qualities, right? That are being responsible, um, having good self-management, being social, uh, having those uh, interpersonal skills, having good self-esteem and being honest and having integrity. These would be considered workforce foundations. When it comes to employability skills, which you're gonna hear referred to as soft skills and you'll see a few slides in a moment that referred to these as soft skills. Um, just think of employability skills as those very essential, very needed, and there's just a laundry list, right? There's nothing all encompassing here, but these are skills and attributes that are needed um, for an individual to interact effectively and, and harmoniously with another, another person. These employability skills or soft skills are very hard to measure. They're very hard to quantify but they're essential, right? So communication, listening, uh, collaborating. Why are we doing this in pairs? Why are we doing a think pair share? Why am I doing this in a group? Well, think about why am I joining a team? Well, you're working on your teamwork and you're 
ability to collaborate that happens on the job. Um, resilience, probably my favorite word, resiliency. Um, being resilient, being punctual, being creative, having a good work ethic, being persistent, um, being able or willing and open to learn, um, being able to resolve conflict. And then again, this is not an all income. I couldn't income. I couldn't type up all the different types. This is just an example, and I, I have some slides with some other examples. But um, think about these are these are skills needed for an individual to obtain and maintain a job. Very important, often referred to as soft skills. But again, soft skills has this connotation that they're very easily developed and they're not. When it comes to a lot of our students and the millennials, um, you'll, there are some top five to top 10 skills that they need to develop to be able to, to gain employment. Um, number one, think of respect for authority. Hard to measure, but it's either it's there or it's not. Being punctual, you know, I talked to all these kids, it's important for you to be in your seat and ready to work when the bell rings. Why? Because you're gonna need that on the job. And so many students think that they're gonna be able to develop it later on. And I, I, I share with them how many people I know that got fired or got their hours cut from not being punctual, for not being timely, for not being ready to work. When I worked at Trader Joe's, Back in my college days, I had to be on the work, ready to work right when my shift started. I didn't show up at five in the morning. I showed up at 4.45 and I was on the floor probably at, uh, uh, you know, right before five o'clock already working. You know, um, one thing employers talk about with, with uh, skills is uh, being able to give eye contact, good eye contact and a firm handshake. I know with COVID, uh, our students haven't, haven't been able to practice that. Right, but um, I think of Mr. Zank, who used to teach consumer math at North Salinas High School before he moved to Salinas High. And he would always greet every student on his way up the ramp to his classroom. He'd give him a, a firm handshake and, and give eye contact, give eye contact and say, you know, how are you today? Um, in, in my career center, I did a, an exercise with, with um, students, um, not before COVID, right, where I'd have students uh, identify a skill that they had and exemplify it through story using complete sentences and giving eye contact, right? Um, give me eye contact, tell me a skill you have and exemplify it through an through a story. Um, just preparing for job interview, preparing for the world of work, being professional. And then again, using that academic mature vocabulary. I think of Bill Cosby and I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody. Um, I know he's, he's kind of, uh, but I remember, um, Bill Cosby used to say in the 80s when he was popular, there was the street language and then there was the uh, academic language, right? And you had to know both. Um, when it comes to another, again, soft skills that are needed for our students in preparing for the world of work, being assertive, not so passive. Um, you might find this when you come back. I, I taught summer school and I was just shocked at how uh, passive the students were this summer. But having a year and a half off of school I guess it's to be expected, but being assertive now, being assertive, I, I, I exist, I'm here. I'm not being aggressive, not being passive aggressive, not being passive, but asserting yourself, that's needed. Having a positive attitude, having self-control, right? Um, take your hood off. I, I shouldn't even have to tell you again, just do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it. Having that self-control, um, being able to listen, right? Sometimes we don't grade students on listening, but listening is essential, it's needed with so many other skills when it comes to employability and life. <clears throat> Having empathy, um, very important, very important when it comes for the jobs that many of our students are gonna be getting. Um, being responsible and taking responsibility, not taking things personally. I know someone mentioned that in the chat room earlier. When you're working retail, you're working that first job, uh, it can be pretty tough, but, but depersonalizing, right? Um, and then having an appropriate sense of humor, right? And then of course, you know, clear communication, having that, uh, being able to speak clearly and write clearly and write legibly and listen, right? Um, very important for the world of work. It, juxtaposed to employability skills, which are hard to measure, we have technical skills. So these are specific tasks that are teachable 
and, and you can learn through repetition um, and, and these can be measured. So I think of Mr. Spencer in his classroom teaching students how to type, and how many words per minute, you can measure that. These, these would be on the resume right next to the employability skills, right? So can you type how many words per minute? Are you fluent in another language? Are you bilingual? Are you bicultural? Bicultural, maybe hard to measure. Bilingual, uh, you can measure it. There's a test. There's a test you'd have to take to be able to be note that someone is truly uh, fluent in a different language and truly bilingual. Computer skills, knowing blockchain, knowing cloud computing, knowing database management. Again, I think of Mr. Spencer, Mr. Bauman, and teaching their computer classes. These would be your technical skills that students could learn to put on a resume or a curriculum vita. Welding, technical skill, right, can be measured, can be tested. Driving a forklift can be measured, can be tested. Cooking, I think Mrs. Diaz, who's in the room, either you're a good cook or you're a bad cook. Either you did it the right way or you didn't do it the right way. Either you followed the instructions or you didn't and they can be measured. Um, also, when it comes to technical, I went to Cal Poly, um, polytechnical, right? So uh, in many respects, the, uh, the, uh, the arts come into play, you know? So, so think about playing a musical instrument and I will tell you there is a crossover, you know, students who, who have that fine motor skill from develop, they've developed by learning how to play the guitar or learning how to play the violin, those fine motor skills, they, they become, actually they, they transfer over and they become better welders, right? They have that, they have that hand-eye coordination. So we have employability skills and we have technical skills. Um, now, just kind of before I introduce the mindset component, um, I kind of want to go down a rabbit hole, but not too far. So we have our skills, right? Which I tend to really focus deeply on. And I'm telling you, maybe it's best to, to adopt this model employability and technical skills. Um, and again, these both are super important and both can be developed uh, through, through patience and training, even though someone may have a talent with regard to a certain skill. Some might, might be a quote unquote natural musician or a natural welder, or they might be a natural on the keyboard typing, or they may be a natural in the kitchen cooking um, or a natural public speaker. There are attributes that are not quite skills, and these are personal qualities that make us who we are as individuals. So think about it as someone charming or funny, interesting or intelligent, generous, gregarious, inventive, sincere, humble. Uh, these are not skills, but there are certain personal attributes that people have. And these all interplay, right, when it comes to preparing students for life. And then we have traits. And these are ingrained characteristics or habits. Is someone confident? Is someone shy? Those would be traits. And importantly, their mindsets, right? So the mindsets would be basically our attitudes on how we understand the world, our beliefs and our belief systems. And even though I tend to focus deeply on skills, employability, technical, soft, hard, workforce foundations. Uh, there is an argument that mindsets are more important than skills. And why? Because a mindset is really difficult to kind of develop and, and maybe learn or unlearn. And skills can be gained with the right mindset, but not the other way around. If you don't have the right mindset, you don't have the right thoughts in your mind and the right habits of mind, you're not going to be open to learn, right? New skills. So skills and mindsets. When it comes to mindsets, there are so many different conceptual models here, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Typically in education, we focus on two, the fixed or the growth. Then people will throw in fixed and growth and benefit mindsets. And I've seen seven all the way up to 20 20 some odd different mindsets. But when it comes to mindsets, just think of habits of mind that can be developed very, take a long time to develop and take a long time to kind of unlearn. Um, they basically shape our worldview and our lives. Um, they could 
limit us and harm us or help us um, by creating certain blind spots. Um, and they're all created by our own experiences, right? Um, so think of uh, maybe these three as, as, as kind of interesting for us. Um, we have the benefit mindset, which is kind of added to the fixed and the growth mindset. Um, the fixed mindset tends to be someone who, who knows uh, their skill set and, and really wants to focus on the skills or abilities that they have and that they think and, and they, they're not really open to developing others. Um, and they're focused mostly on performance and creating certain products. And you have the growth mindset, which is maybe more open to, uh, to other, um, to learning and, and developing other attributes and skills, right? And then the benefit mindset. So your fixed mindset would be your expert who wants to avoid failure, who focuses on what they know and what they're good at, and, and really wants to perfect those few limited things, where you have someone with a growth mindset. And again, think about the world of work. Think about someone with the growth mindset who probably um, wants to keep on learning just for the sake of learning and is open to it. Um, and then someone with a benefit mindset who is maybe someone in your leadership class who wants to th thinks of health and happiness helping themselves and helping society and helping the world around them, all right? Um, so what does this mean for the classroom? Um, what does this mean? So maybe I, when I worked in LA Unified 24 years ago, there was a section on our, on our lesson plans that we had to show our administrators that, that focused on skills. And, and what skills are you developing by this lesson? We had to state them explicitly in our lesson plan. Not only did we state them explicitly in our lesson plan, we stated them explicitly at the beginning of class. By the end of the period, you will learn this. This is why you're doing it. This is how you're gonna do it. And this is how I'm gonna know that you've asked to actually mastered it, right? So you wanna maybe state this in your lesson plan or state this at the beginning of class. And this, in LA Unified, this is how I was evaluated. I used to have uh, an evaluator, Mr. Saul Bialik, who would come to my classroom. And he walked in there and he saw 30 plus students focused, reading, everything was fine. If they were engaged and working on a certain skill, he was fine, that was enough, he enjoyed the visit. Um, but he also wanted us to state it explicitly at, at the beginning of class um, and, and also state certain standards. Um, you might wanna have these written and displayed. I'll, I'll show you some examples of that that I did this, this summer. Um, and they might be helpful to point to especially when you're working with those students who are questioning the relevance and questioning um, you know, the why, why we're doing this. And then you might wanna start stating these explicitly on an individual basis to develop self-efficacy, right? So, so this summer when I was working and teaching students, I, I taught ninth grade English this summer, you know, I, I pointed out certain employability skills that students had. You know, wow, you're very empathetic. Oh, very, you're very conscientious. Wow, you're so punctual. And, and sometimes students have skills that they're not aware of and they need to develop that self-efficacy, that awareness. So that way they can actually state it in a job interview and it kind of builds self-esteem. So on to in the back of my career center at North High, I have a bulletin board and, and it has uh, not just skills, not just skills, but it also has uh, certain mindsets and aptitudes, but that's it. So, th so I can always point to it when I'm doing my workshop or when I'm doing so many instruction in there, I can point to it and I can say, wow, you know, you're very adaptable or you're very creative or you're so kind and empathetic, right? So that, that you might wanna display these on a poster or you might wanna display these on a bulletin board in your classroom. This summer when I was teaching ninth grade English, I just started jotting them down on a bulletin board, not a, on a, a whiteboard that was on the side of the classroom. You know, wow, you're very trustworthy. You know, that's important. Or in the narratives that we were reading, okay, reading Gary Soto's book or reading uh, Victor Villasenor's book, we kind of pointed out some of the employability skills that were present in not only in the literature or the characters there, but also the characters that I had in the classroom this summer. Wow, you know what? You're very optimistic and that's great. Oh, you know, you're so independent, but you're gonna have, to, they, could, they couldn't work together this summer. They were all divided by plexiglass wearing masks. So there was no collaboration going on, but there was collaboration in the narratives. But this is just maybe a, a thought 
maybe display these and point to them and just note them when you're giving your instruction. Oh, you know, today we're going to be doing this and here's why. We're reading Romeo and Juliet. I'm never going to use Romeo and Juliet in my life. Well, yeah, you're probably right. No one's going to ask you about the Montagues and the Capulets, right? No one's going to ask you about a Shakespearean sonnet. But by understanding a Shakespearean sonnet, you're developing your thinking abilities and you're developing your reading. And by listening to this, you're developing your listening and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So really that was my, that's kind of how I sell it. And, and it's true, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's really what matters. So anyway, I don't want to take up most of your time. I know lunch is on the way, but hopefully you've, earned, you've learned a little bit about skills and mindsets and, and maybe really discussing those for those students in your classroom that you're working with that, that question the relevance, right? And the parents that question the relevance, right? And uh, maybe you can incorporate this in your own individual way in your classroom this fall. Thank you. Here is the, the eval link. You can cut and paste. Maybe I can post it in the chat or someone can post it in the chat. I can't cut and paste that in the chat. Um, so I, I, um, I can share the chat. Um, I can share, well, this is all posted in their Google link that they created. Um, um, so career readiness. So there's so many questions now going on. Um, I, it's, I know that the, the presentation has been shared and actually um, I am writing an article out of this presentation. I have a PhD. I have to publish or perish. I have to get a couple of publications every, every year. Um, every year or else I, I lose my, my, my adjunct assistant professor position at St. Mary's. But um, anyhow, I can, um, I can actually, I can, I, I know this is shared and actually when I, after finishing the article, I can share that as well. Um, you can always reach out to me and I can share what I have. Um, can you share a site with your students uh, on employability skills? Um, I can work with you on that. I have a list and a publication that I, that I, I have. Um, I, can, I can work with you on that. And I think I have some on my website, Um I can, I can work with you on that. Um, um, and so career readiness is life readiness, right? Because career is a journey and career readiness, wow. Um, yeah, being ready to to have eight to ten jobs throughout your throughout your career, right? We tend to have, in the past we focused on one occupation. What work interests you? What is that one job that's very passe? So career readiness, being employable, and being able to to be career resilient and 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 career ready means being able to have a multitude of jobs because the world of work is changing and ebbing and flowing. Um, and we can work on strategies if you just shoot me an email. Um, Brian, I can write it down here. All right, thank you, appreciate you, thank you. Any other questions, go ahead and put in the chat. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, appreciate you. Thank you, appreciate you. Have a good rest of your summer. Thank you, thank you. B. Brian Blair, you're funny. <laughs> hey.
Oh, thank you, Eric. Nice to see you. Nice to see your name. Thank you.